Hey everybody, it's Ripley back again. Hope everybody's uh, doing okay today. We're gonna talk about antiderivatives, which should be kind of fun. Um, I think you'll enjoy them. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so let's give it a definition first. You've, I know that you've already heard of these and you're gonna start thinking in terms of integrals very quickly. Oh, by the way, congratulations everybody. You are officially done. If you're on this video, you are done with differential calculus. Although, as you probably have figured out at this point, there's no such thing as being done with anything in calculus, right? It just keeps coming back. Um, you're going to be taking derivatives until the last day that you ever do calculus, just so you know. All right, so let's let's give a definition of an antiderivative. We say that capital F of x is the antiderivative. Whoops, antiderivative. Sorry about that. Is the antiderivative of f of x if and only if f primed of x is equal to lowercase f of x. It's easy, right? So, for example, what do we know about y equals sine of x? What is, we know what its derivative is. We know that y primed is equal to cosine of x, which implies that sine of x is, equal, is the antiderivative. So if f of x equals cosine of x, then capital F of x is sine of x because, well, it's one of the antiderivatives, and I'll explain that here in just a second. Um, because when I take the derivative of sine of x, I get cosine of x. So it's this relationship. Now, let's play around just a little bit. What if f of x, let's see what you got. What if f of x equals, I don't know, let's go x cubed plus 3x plus 1. Now, what would the antiderivative be? Now, think about this. I need a function that when I take a derivative, I get x cubed or 3x or 1. Well, let's start with the 1. That's the easiest piece, right? The derivative of what function? So that's the conversation that you're going to have with yourself. The derivative of what function is 1? Well, that's pretty easy, right? That's just x. We know that's a linear term. Now, how about this guy? What? Let's see. How am I going to produce a 3x. Well, I, I know I start with an x squared, and the thing that I need to go away is that 2. Um, when I take the derivative of x squared, I get a 2x, but I want a 3x. So what do I do? Well, I know that the 3 is just a constant that's along for the ride, and I know that when I multiply by the 2, the exponent, to take the derivative, remember, I move in this direction to take derivatives, I move in this direction to take antiderivatives, I'm going to need a 2 there. Now let's check the beauty of antiderivatives. You can always check your work, right? The derivative of x is 1. The derivative of 3x squared is 3x. Now how about the last term? How about x cubed? Well, I'm going to, I know that it's going to be x to the fourth, right? Because we know how polynomials work, right? The derivative of x to the fourth produces an x cubed. So when I take the derivative of this, I need the 4 to cancel. So I divide by 4. Now this is a, <coughs> this is a single antiderivative of this function. You may be going, wait, Ripley, what? What does that mean? Well, think about this. Remember, if there were a constant here, let's do this. This is a biggie because students forget to put this guy and then it costs them points. If there were a constant here, say plus 17, plus 19, minus 89 pi, whatever, when I took the derivative of this, f prime of x, I would get x cubed plus 3x, plus 1, right? And the constant would disappear. So what we get is called a family of curves. This guy right here, put this one in blue, this right here is the family of curves. So, of curves. All right, so let's keep it simple. Let's say that I've got the, the, the let's go f of x is equal to x squared plus 1, or plus, yeah, screw it plus one. I know then that x cubed is equal to x, or uh, x cubed. I know then that the antiderivative, I'm doing this stuff in my head too quickly, is equal to x cubed thirds plus x plus c. So if I were to go and graph this, it would, the, the function would completely depend, the antiderivative function would completely depend on the value of c. So the question is, what do I need to be able to solve for this c? What do I need to be able to solve for this, this thing right here? Well, think about this. Remember, this is still a function. So this could be written as y equals x cubed thirds plus x 
plus C. So what if I wanted to be able to solve for C? Well, look close. I would just need a point. I would need an initial value, right? Which kind of makes sense, because if I were to graph this function, what I would get, what I would get was a bunch of cubics, right? I, I don't know that they would look like this, but depending on the value of C, I would get a bunch of functions that look like that. Wow, those get worse and worse, don't they? However, if I can lock in, if I know that this antiderivative passes through a specific point, then it locks in on a solution right there. So for example, I don't know, that kind of looks like two comma one. Let's say I know that the antiderivative of this passes through two comma one. Well, look at what I gotta do, it's easy. I would put a one for the y, I would put a two for the x, so I get eight thirds plus 2, plus c. And now I can solve for c, right? 8 thirds plus 6 thirds is 14 thirds. 3 thirds minus 14 thirds is negative 11 thirds, right? Equals c. Let me double check that. <laughs> negative 1 minus 8 thirds. Yep, yeah, that's negative 11 thirds. So that tells me that this is, my, this is called the general antiderivative. The general antiderivative. And it produces a family of curves. Deri whoa, derivative. What is going on here? Derivative. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> My bad. Um, and this is the specific antiderivative for, for uh, the initial value at 2, 1. So minus 11 thirds. Super easy. Now, watch this. We're going to do one last thing. Like I said, this, this uh, I think I said it, um, this section doesn't take very long at all. Um, let's, let's look at a few antiderivatives that we should know. Like, for example, if y equals 1 over 2 root x. Uh, what do you think is going to be the antiderivative? What is capital F of x? Well, what function has a derivative that is 1 over 2 root x? Well, it's the square root of x, right? How about this guy? Uh, how about if y equals negative 1 over x squared? Well, you're probably saying that the antiderivative is 1 over x. You can always check your work, right? Just Take the derivative and make sure that you get back to the antiderivative, or that you get back to the original function. Now, careful, I'm being a little bit lazy. Don't forget, I have to add that arbitrary constant in here, right? So be careful. All right, in general, if f of x is equal to x to the n, how do I get to the antiderivative? Well, what are we doing? We're adding one, remember this is a polynomial term, right? We're adding one to the exponent. However, when I take the derivative of this and I need to get back to just x to the n, I have to divide by one. And guess what I get? x to the n plus one over n plus one plus c, which is easy. Watch, if I wanted to take the antiderivative of this, even though we know what the antiderivative is, I would get one half x to the negative one half, right? That's what, that's what y is up here. So if I want the antiderivative, even though we know what it is, the 1 half is along for the ride, right? I'm going to add 1 to negative 1 half, so I get x to the 1 half, and then I'm going to divide by the 1 half. And look, 1 halves cancel, and this is the square root of x, just like we knew. That's kind of helpful, right? We also know antiderivatives of all of the trigs that we've memorized and all of the inverse trigs that we've memorized. So remember when I said to make flashcards and I said, okay, here's y equals tangent x and you want to know dy over dx is secant squared? Well, guess what? If you want to memorize some antiderivatives, it's pretty simple. Just use your flashcards in reverse. When you see secant squared and you want to go reverse, you're like, oh, what's the antiderivative of secant squared? Now just whoop, go backwards. Now, when we want to take the antiderivative of tangent, that's going to get more complicated. That's down the road. We have to use something called integration by substitution to be able to do that. So I know that tangent of x plus c is the antiderivative of secant squared x. So all those trigs, all those inverse trigs, right? I mean, for example, if I know uh, that y equals 1 over 1 plus x squared. You're definitely going to want to memorize this, but it's not hard to memorize because it's already on your flashcards. Hopefully you did that. Your antiderivative would be inverse tan of x plus c. So yeah, just whip out your, your, your flashcards that you made for derivatives and then just run them in, in reverse to memorize the antiderivatives. 
Okay, cool. So, like I said, you, the, not, there's nothing really new here, is there? I mean, there's this little formula, which you could probably figure out without having to memorize the formula. In fact, you will. It'll become so ingrained in you, you, don't, you won't have to think about it. Okay, that said, I want to I want to do something. I want to do Newton's law of rect rectilinear motion. So if I'm talking about <clears throat> if I take if I take a rock and I throw it straight up, I guess it's not law, it's Newton's equation for rectilinear motion. If, and I throw it straight up, we know it goes up and we know it goes down. But if I want to graph it, like if I want to graph its position, we'll call this y of t and t. I know that it's parabolic. And let's say that I throw it some from some initial height. I'm going to call this h naught. Now, remember, we got to be careful here because I'm throwing the rock straight up and then it's falling straight back down. I am not throwing it at an angle. If I'm throwing it at an angle, things change, okay? Because um, we have to take into account like horizontal, what, what component of the, of the velocity is horizontally um, distributed and what component is vertically distributed. And that distribution is probably not the perfect word for it, but you know what I mean. Let's say that it has an initial height and then I throw it at some initial velocity. All right? Now watch, I'm going to build the equation using antiderivatives. And here's the coolest thing about what Newton did, especially once he figured out the calculus, is he said, okay, here's what I know. I know that the acceleration of gravity is negative 9.8 meters per second per second, which we'll just call it meters per second squared. So this is my A, right? I know A of T always on Earth, and I know you're, there's going to be arguments, well, Ripley, the acceleration of gravity is different at altitude and versus uh, sea level. Well, yeah, it, sure it is, but minuscule amounts, right? We can agree with that. Okay, so here we go. I know if I, if I want to go from acceleration to velocity, well, we know acceleration is the derivative of velocity, so velocity is the antiderivative of acceleration. So I know I'm going to get negative 9.8 t, right? And this is v of t, not v of x, plus some arbitrary constant. But I know that it had an initial velocity at time t equals 0. So v of 0 is equal to, that's which is v naught, but I'll, I'm going to write this out, negative 9.8 times 0 plus c, and this equals v naught. Well, that crosses out, so c equals v naught. So v of t is equal to negative 9.8 t plus v naught. Now take the antiderivative of that. That'll give me position, right? I'll have y of t, because the derivative of position is velocity. So the antiderivative of velocity is position. So I'm going to now think about this. I'm going to add, think of this as t to the first. So I'm going to add 1 to it. I'll get a t squared. I'm going to divide by 2, but 2 goes into negative 9.8, so I get negative 4.9 t squared, right? Because Think of this as negative 9.8 t squared over 2. That's what that term turns into. Now, this is going to be plus v naught t, because v naught is just a constant. V naught, your initial velocity didn't change. It is what it is. Now, here's where it gets a little tricky. Do you agree that if I write c as a mathematician, I have made an error? Because I have assumed that this c and this c notationally are exactly the same. So we have to be really careful with that. If we're taking multi-antiderivatives, multi-antiderivatives, multiple antiderivatives, and I have this, this arbitrary constant that I have to account for, I want to make sure that I denote it differently. So this is going to be C, and I'm going to call this one C1, right? So I know that Y of 0 is equal to negative 4.9 times 0 squared plus V naught times 0 plus C1, and that equals we know it was thrown from the initial height, which we'll call h naught. Goodbye, goodbye. Hey, guess what? C1 equals the initial height. So y of t is equal to negative 4.9 t squared plus v naught t plus h naught. And guess what? You've seen that equation before. In fact, you've probably seen this if I wanted to throw my rock at on any planet or with any gravity, for those of you that are like, you know, it's not exactly negative 9.8, we can simply say this is negative a t squared over 2, right, plus v naught t plus h naught. And guess what? You have the equation for rectilinear motion, which is very interesting. <laughs> I like it. All right, that's enough for today. Um, hopefully that gets you where you need to be, and uh, enjoy antiderivatives, because guess what? We're getting into integral calculus next. That should be awesome. Right. Whoa, what just happened there? Let's get that out of there. <laughs> Have a good day.